artificial stumbling blocks, malice, lack of information, and artificial division have caused you an oral appearance, some you mention, and others you know, but who in the forefront have been in the forefront to deviate from the path of pursuing national unity, patriotism, and nationalistic service to build a better Liberia, where democracy and all the rights and inseparable duties appertaining there to may be enjoyed by everyone in Liberia. I have, I want to refer, refer you to the 26th day of August 2008, one of the witnesses, a former leader of INPFL, in person of Prince Y. Johnson, because I refer to the people in the capacity they serve at the time they were, because we are not taking into consideration after 2003, October. He said that uh, when they took over, when you became interim chairman, he, he got Mr. Petri with the Vinter, who went to the bank, the central bank, and they gave you about 8 point, your interim government, about $8.1 million plus to start the interim government. He said that you all took this money when you look a few weeks after, thereafter, you all planted, uh, made new money, and that caused the JJ and the other money to be out of circulation. But he also gave me the impression, I don't know about others, that that money was misappropriated, and that the problem started with you all because you took the money and you went abroad to build a house, to pay for house houses in America. I would like for you to please, although in your testimony here, you talk about the reason why you all change the currency. But I want you to address the issue about misusing the currency and taking the money to America to buy houses. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> I was hoping that I would not have to dignify the rants and raves of uh, Mr. Johnson with a comment. But I think it is important, as you have rightly said, to deal with the allegations Mr. Johnson is a pathological liar. And as I said earlier in my statement, if there are pathologies in all of these pronouncements and these testimonies, this commission has an obligation to search out the truth. And if lies are a result of a pathology, to seek treatment for those who have such pathologies. The interesting comments, or the interesting thing about the comments, is that there are witnesses, there are people who means he called, and they're here, respectable people. David Vinton, Nat Petri, both of them served under the interim government as, as governor, and I think deputy governor, of the bank. At no time did I take delivery of, or in any way had any financial transaction with Mr. Johnson. 
maybe I should take that back. Maybe we did have one financial transaction. When we changed the currency, we made worthless containers of money that were floating around here, perhaps containers that may have also been on his base. And I observe that from the moment we changed the currency and made useless those containers of resources, we incurred the anger, the rage, and the tendency to slander from some of those people who had amassed resources through looting. Now, regarding the individuals that whose name he called as being accomplices, I should say, in all of this, I repeat, these people are here. I have the highest of regard for Governor Vinton. He came to that position highly recommended by people in the financial um, industry of this country. I think those people are respectable people. Vinton comes also with a wealth of experience. And I should tell you, he's a man of impeccable integrity. I'm very pleased that I had an opportunity to work with him. Madam, Whit, uh, Madam Commissioner, I come from a background of people with integrity. I learned very early in my childhood, as much as I liked to be part of organizations, my parents taught me that in all my social organizational uh, uh, activities, to stay away from the money. I instilled that in my younger brothers. We all grew up in the high Y, the YMCA, you know, student politics. Never had we been treasurers, financial secretaries, and all of that. I've worked in positions at the University of Liberia, becoming dean and running a budget. Not a single day could anybody in administration or in the university tell you that there were questions of money and misappropriations that involved me. I served as chairman of the Constitution Commission, and in that position I ran a budget of more than a million dollars. In a hostile environment, Mr. Doe had me audited and the audit was with the intention of prosecuting me. He had the general audit go in and do an audit after a professional auditing firm had indeed audited those accounts. And I need not tell you that given the relationship I had with Samuel Doe and the fact that he found it necessary to, 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 to lock me up in jail, if he had found one reason as a matter of financial impropriety, he would have thrown me in jail for stealing. He couldn't. Try as he did. I was head of this interim government. It was not a social club. It was a government. There was a Ministry of Finance, and a central bank. There were banks all around this place. Not a single day did I write a note to Governor Vinton or to anybody in financial management of this country to say, send me up this money or send me up that money. Even the contingency that was for the presidency to be used as discretionary funds. There were other people on my staff who handled this. And what did we do with it? Contributions to churches when they invite you when some student comes and uh, wants school fees paid and all of that. I never handled that. I didn't even know how much was in that account. 
you can ask the people who worked with, with me on this. You can check the records. Because after the interim government, there were succeeding governments. Mr. Taylor came into Monrovia as part of a transitional government. It is no secret that we were not the best of friends. Mr. Chitela had oversight responsibility of the Ministry of Finance, if you recall. If Mr. Taylor for one minute, and the records were there, could have found one evidence that I had had myself linked with improprieties in financial matters, he would have nailed me and he would have done it publicly. He couldn't because not a single day did I have any contacts with the Ministry of Finance of a matter that was outside the public uh, process. At one point he called in Liberian business, young business, business people and he was trying them to say what a mess I had left behind and what indeed they had discovered with respect to improprieties. And you know what he had to show them? A telephone bill to say that I had used $2,000 worth of telephone, bill, uh, of telephone calls. One of those persons who indeed was familiar with LTC said to the president, to, to, I think it was Vice Chairman Dan Taylor, let me see that bill. On that bill were calls to Pakistan, to uh, Cyprus, and all that. And this person said to him, well, I don't know. I don't think Dr. Sawyer has any connection with people in Pakistan and Cyprus. We know what the system was at that time. People were, you know, putting, both in the LTC and elsewhere, there were all kinds of shenanigans going on with respect to in-house stealing of telephone calls and that sort of thing. But even that as it may, if the only thing that Mr. Taylor could find was a telephone bill of $2,000, then I think that speaks to my record. Nobody, I defy anybody, and this is not only to those who come and, and, and uh, testify here, but anybody, anywhere, to produce evidence of improprieties, stealing and pilfering in, of public funds attributed to me. I defy them. This is an open challenge. Open challenge to everybody, anywhere. I worked for 11 years at the University of Liberia. And I hardly, one day, one month, hardly, very seldom, did I take home a full paycheck. I signed deferment forms for students. Many of them can testify to this. Francis Johnson, who is the, uh, I think he's now the, uh, in the Foreign Ministry, Inspector General of Foreign Ministry, was our controller. He can attest to it. The records are there. The hundreds of deferred payments I had to pay over 11 years from my salary. It was not by accident or by bribery or whatever that when Doe threw me in jail, university students of all shades of opinion stood up in my defense. Not only because I provided sacrificial service of this financial quality, but I went to my job prepared. I gave them the best I had. And I treated everyone, without exception, in spite of ideological differences. I treated them fairly, and I appreciated a good logical argument, no matter what the persuasion of the student. And so that's my record. I left the university, and I went to the United States, and I got a job as a professor. God has been kind to me and my family, and so has this country. We receive fairly good education. My talents are marketable. I was hired by Indiana University, 
and I worked there. My family lived in Maryland. We lived in a townhouse. We paid collectively about $1,500 a month for the townhouse in rent. My brother is a medical doctor, well trained, he's in the United States, he's a urologist, some of you may know him, he's done very well there. I have another brother who is an electrical engineer, he worked many years at LEC, and by the way, when I was in the interim government and he was at LEC, he did not hold the position of managing director. There is not one bone of nepotism in my body. He served in, in positions that he had worked his way into on merits until he left. So he's in the United States. He has a job as an electrical engineer and he's doing well. I have sisters and I have another brother who's an economist. And he is working as such. I have two sisters in the States. One is a public school teacher, one is a social worker. My wife and I were both employed in the United States. Together we make an income of more than $100,000. Indiana University records are there. They can be accessed if you think I'm lying about what I do there. Until I took this position, I was co-director of one of the most prestigious public policy institutes not only at the university, but in the United States, highly ranked. I'm considered a governance expert. I, from time to time, am called upon as a consultant. I was the one who served as the reviewer, the expert to review South Africa's governance performance in the area of political governance. And I traveled down there on and off for several months doing this work. I get paid when I do such things by, by whomever indeed are the people who need the service. My consultancies from time to time involve the United Nations, ECOWAS, the ECA, the International Peace Institute, and a range of institutions. I have written three books, scores of articles on questions of governance, and in peer review journals, professional journals. I'm not saying these things to be boastful. But I think it's important to lay my background out to Liberians who do not know me and might be uh, laboring under the impression that others would try to give them that I come here with a cup in hand looking for looted goods or I come here because I have no options. I have choices. But this country, that, it, that through its public educational system, I went to Kipamas High School. It's a public school. I started off first in Sino at the St. Joseph School, and today I helped to raise money for that Catholic school. Got some foundation there. I went to the University of Liberia, and I graduated from the university. So most of my education was right here, from taxpayers' money. I feel an obligation to give something back, and that's why I come back home, and I want to be here. And because I have the options, if I cannot make the kind of living here, I can do the consultancies that I'm talking about. I command international rates in excess of $500 a day, excluding daily subsistence allowance. You can ask the UN people if you want. They come to me, and they want me to do this stuff. But I do it when I can. I have a commitment here. Indiana University, when I told them I was leaving to come and work in my country for these purposes, gave me an extended leave with pay. You can write them and find out. 
they have me yet on their payroll. Not because they're full of cash, but they value my service there, and they value also the role that I play here. As those of you who know of American universities, they like this to be on the university record, that some of their faculty members are performing a service like this. They take this to their board of trustees. They take this to the supporters of the university, and they make millions of dollars on it. So it's an investment for them. So, I remember, I, I didn't want to go to this length. But I thought, you know, please, I don't want anybody in the audience to think that this is a boastful man. My own style is one of modesty, low-key, and interacting with people, respecting them. But I don't think that should be mistaken. I don't think modesty should be mistaken, you know, for uh, uh, trickery and, 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 and deception and, and, and roguish tendencies. None of these have ever been in my past and with God's help will never be in my future. At this point in time, we left the townhouse where we all contributed to paying $1,500 a month and secured a house. By the way, that townhouse, I should tell you, was photographed and put in a newspaper here uh, by Goodrich. He published this paper called The Diaspora. And you know the American row of houses. He photographed the entire row and put it in the papers. My wife sued him in the American courts. And that case, maybe the statute of limitation may have uh, passed now, but that case was called. And many of us had to prevail upon her to say, look, you know, when you're in politics, your life should be an open book. You're in the kitchen, you must stand the heat. And so that was dropped. There was an occasion, well, of course, we moved from that townhouse into a single family dwelling, made a down payment of about $15,000. Anybody who is aware of the mortgage system in the United States know that you can own a home by making a down payment. You can buy a home of $250,000, perhaps by making a $5,000 down payment and paying mortgage regularly. We did that. We did that. And we bought this home in the United States. And I should tell you more. Since we bought that home, and since I have been at Indiana University since 2001, with an appreciable income, the fact that we had to move to Indiana mean we could not live in Maryland where this home is. So what did we do? We refinanced that home. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. You can go back to the mortgage company and from the assets you would have accumulated by paying your mortgage and paying it on time, you can take some of that money out. And that's what we did. And we made a down payment on the home that we live in, in Bloomington, Indiana. And so for those who don't know, I have two homes, not one. Both of which we're paying mortgage on. The one in Maryland, we have it under lease. There's some people staying in there now. They are paying rent. We take that rent to pay the mortgage. The way the housing situation is bad now in the United States, we have to include, uh, increase that with another $150 so that it fits the mortgage payment for the day. We intend at some point when we're coming home to sell the houses and bring whatever uh, investments we have in it, whatever equity, and invest it here. The home that we have in um, Bloomington, 
we are accumulating equity in it. And I can tell you, we started to renovate our home here in Monrovia, in Cardwell, with, again, a refinancing, two refinances we've had on our Maryland property to take some money and put it in a renovation of the house that we have in Cardwell. My life and my financial dealings, they are all open books. I have absolutely nothing to hide and absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. So, when a reporter from the Inquirer came to a press conference I was holding at the executive mansion, stood up and had his hands in his pocket and I said to him, take your hands out of your pocket and if you don't respect me, show some respect to this office. This man got enraged. He went on a U.S. or something visit to the States, took this house picture, brought it and slammed it over the newspaper, the newspapers, about the $600,000 house that I owned in the rich neighborhood with the Kennedys. Lies. The house is in Maryland, in a community called Germantown. For those of you who know the United States, you would know that this is a middle class community. No flushy things. The neighbor we had was a retired police officer, a man who reached the rank of lieutenant in the, uh, the, the, the police force. One, the other neighbor was a retired uh, uh, government employee of some kind. A third neighbor was a salesman. He traveled around the Beltway uh, selling commodities. So this is the story that I want you to hear. I'll be pleased to answer any further questions about it. And I'd be pleased at any time to provide whatever information that you may want. Sorry to be so long-winded, but I think it was important to get this out. Yes, Dr. Sawyer, because there's a maxim apart from the fact that this is truth-telling and sometimes people have a story, but they don't tell the truth. So we have to go now and find it true. There's a maxim that says, he who is silent when he should speak assents. Yeah. So we don't want yeah. for people to take their silence for others to take, consider it to be that they assent or they agree. Yes, please. So it's in that light, I pursue my question. Uh, when on the 26th day of August 2008, former rebel leader for the INPFL, Prince Johnson, said that you had wise men, a wise man committee, when you were chairman of the Interim National Assembly. And these wise men, he wrote a 12 count, 12 print count to you on what he considered the ills or deviation from your instructed mandate for the iron interim government, IGNU, and he wrote those 12 points to you. After two weeks, he was invited. He was invited to the, your Duco, and these 12, these uh, wise men, later he invited them to his office, in fact, he went to his office on his base, abusing his words. He told them to tie them. Among them was a pastor, so he locked them up, each one of them, and gave them a cartoon of Bacardi to drink, and said that if they did not drink the Bacardi, he would Quote, kill them. Could you please, he could not remember the names of the wise men except there was a pastor. Uh, could you please give me for history the names of those you consider wise men, if you remember? 
perhaps a wise or whatever they consider a wise man that will lock up. Your times of reference will be those who will lock up for more than a week or so and give him with Bacardi to drink. I can recall two of the four people. I think there were four. Um, one was the late Ambassador Fangalo. The other was Dr. Jabaru Kalon. In the case of both men, first Fangalo, this man was an old man. He was way up in his 70s, if not perhaps early 80s at this time. The treatment that was given Fangalo, as repeated to me by Fangalo, and again, I guess uh, he, your witness is admitting, involved forcing these people to take large dosages of alcohol that they did not want to take. Having them sleep in facilities full of driver, driver ants and subjecting them to all kinds of humiliation. With respect to Dr. Kalon, and he is here and can tell his story. He was forced, or they forced him because he didn't voluntarily do so, to put his hands in a bucket of urine. And they ordered that he should then take his hands take up, scoop up the urine and, and, and drink it. He refused. Men were ordered to force him to do so. They succeeded in sticking his hands in the urine. But he said to them, you will have to shoot me, but I am not going to open my mouth and put this urine in my mouth. Dr. Kalon is here in Monrovia and could tell you his ordeal. I hope during the course of this meeting the names of the other two people would come to me. But there were four. And these people went basically of their own volition to see if they could bring some sanity to the madness that was occurring on that base. And that is what they got as their reward for trying to be peacemakers. Okay. All right, Dr. Sawyer, that's all my questions. And I can say as I started that with those stumbling blocks of lies, rumors, artificial division, and other humiliations. I hope that those virtues which not boastfully but you wanted to give a clear picture of who Dr. Emma Claudia Soria is. I hope that those virtues will be your stepping stone and that you will continue to lift others in order that they may reach their destiny as non-governmental activists, challengers and defenders for peace unity, justice, reconciliation, and nation building in this country. Thank you. We Thank will you. take into consideration your thoughtful recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Hello, sir. Hello, madam. Thank you so much. Um, taking a look at perceptions. 
wrong perceptions that were all around concerning your rule. I don't have uh, many questions, questions to ask. There is only one. And I would ask and say thank you for coming. My question is, during the time that um, Samuel Kanyadu took over the country as president or as um, chairman of the PRC, I can recall, I can remember whether you said you had, you held opposition during that period. But I remember you saying that you had some of your colleagues that were part of um, the PRC. And so my question is, in interacting with all of those, your colleagues, did you get any chance, yeah, or no, about how um, President Talbot was killed? This is my question. And thank you very much for coming. Thank, thank you so much, Madam. What we learned about the, the killing of President Trump, or what I learned about it, I learned mostly when I was in jail. Because when I was arrested and thrown in a stockade, uh, J. Nicholas Podia, if you recall, uh, I guess he was vice chair, first speaker and then vice chair, he too was arrested. Uh, Larry Botte, uh, Jerry Friday, uh, John Newman, I think was his first name, and a few other members of the PRC, along with some others. And for those who know the prison culture here, especially in the stockade, you are let out of your cell and uh, you know, in, you're in the hallway or sometimes you are, you, they let you come out into the yard. But you have a lot of time to interact with other people there. And I remember hearing some of this from these members of the council about how they organized uh, that evening two uh, contingencies. One, to be able to catch uh, the president if he were to go to Bentall. The other, if indeed he stayed at the executive mansion and how they had organized among themselves who were the core people and who were later on brought in and, 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 and all of that. But it is from those people that I learned a little bit more of what happened that night and how the president uh, was, was killed. I had no uh, discussions of this nature with my colleagues because they were not there and actually the reason why I probably never even asked them was because I knew they were not there. Um, so this was a question that the, military, the people in the military we had uh, talked about. I have read the book of Mrs. Talbot where she gives an account and said that she thought she, I think, saw some, some white people or, or what have you. But uh, anything I would have to say further on this would be speculation. I don't know. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam. Your turn. Good afternoon, Mr. Witness, Dr. Sawyer. Welcome again. Thank you. I have a few questions for you. You spoke about 
the necessity to change the currency at the time. Mm -hmm. I think it was from um, JJ Rabbit to Liberty. Yeah. Okay. Can you give any dollar value or assign any dollar value when you change the currency at that time? How much did you? Mm. No, I don't know. Uh, but I tell you who would know? David Vinton would know. Um, frankly, to be honest with you, it was not my place, you know, to, to be a part of working out the technical details. The decision to make the change was a decision in which I exercised the leadership after full consultations with the West African community we made that decision. The technical details as to the companies that would do so, the dollar value, I'm sure they did brief me from time to time. But I could not sit here and tell you it was X amount of money and, and y, amount, y amount of, of money. I do know the company that did the, the printing of the banknotes were the same company that had done the one that we were changing, what is it, the, the JJ to, to the Liberty, De La Rue of, uh, of England, I think they're in London or somewhere. London. Yeah, in L London. This is a reputable uh, security uh, uh, printing uh, house. They do passports, they do uh, banknotes and all of that around, uh, around the world. And I can tell you this much, that if at all there were any pilfering, this was highly unlikely because of the nature of the exercise, because the reputation of the company was on the line, and because the people we dealt with here who, who handled these are people of impeccable character. I'm sure if indeed uh, Governor Vinton were asked, he would be able to give you the full details about the transactions. At the time the money was printed, <coughs> I think Dr. Baron Ta was your uh, finance minister at the time. Yes. And I think he had a problem with going through confirmation as your minister of finance. Yes. But the currency carried his signature. Yes. And I think it remained. Yes. Why was that? It was because the currency was done under strict security and needed to have been done at a particular time. We had assumed that Dr. Ta, like everybody else who went for confirmation, would have been confirmed. And so these matters, when you, once you place an order, and this order requires an engraved signature, it proves problematic after the confirmation, after the order is already in process, to, re, to sort of recall it and make these, uh, make these changes. And so Baron Tar's name appeared on the currency. My next question concerns the gambling bill that the gambling uh, bill that yes. you all opposed at the time. Yes. When I say you all, I mean yes, advocates yes. Mm -hmm. and also uh, the late Abba Port. At the time you opposed the gambling bill, um, one of the arguments behind it was that if a casino was brought here and if gambling was introduced, it will create a vulnerable state for Liberian women. Um, you will have, Liberian women will have become prostitutes. But not too long after the inception of the PRC government under the late President Doe, Ambassador Drew Mason, I, I think, was the chairman of the National Investment Commission. And it was under his watch that um, Mr. Gus Coven Hoven was, I think, awarded the contract for Hotel Africa and, of course, opened the casino. I'm just wondering why, what caused the change so quickly? 
Well, for one thing, this is a question perhaps that Ambassador Mason would, would better answer at some time when he appears before you. But I can tell you that that coalition to oppose the gambling bill was made up of people of a variety of persuasions. Some people were opposed to gambling. Others disliked the fact that the legislature was being bullied and therefore had a more political reason for standing up against the gambling bill. Not because they opposed gambling, but because they did not like the process of bullying the, the legislature into some, uh, some action. I remember having a discussion with Ambassador Mason at that time about this issue. And he did say, I'm not opposed to gambling. And somebody did say to him, well, what about the fact that these people are just being bullied into this? He said, well, then sign me on. But this is again something that I'm sure he will be able to explain. Uh, I remember also at that time, uh, Victor Weeks of uh, the Revelation, who also made it clear that he did not oppose gambling, but Victor, of course, did not participate in a way as indeed Ambassador Mason did in, in, in all of this. So it was a coalition of people, some of whom did not like the stifling of our legislative process, and others genuinely opposed gambling. Okay. Mr. Witness, can you please share with us your perspective on the status of forces agreement and the premature departure of ECOMOC from Liberia um, when Mr. Taylor became president? ECOMOC came to Liberia under the auspices of ECOWAS, obviously, as a decision taken by the Standing Mediation Commi co Committee of ECOWAS. We didn't feel the need to tie ECOMOG at that time and given the conditions under which they came here, the conditions of enormous hardships on our people, when ECOMOG itself had to issue its ration to our people to prevent starvation. We did not think that we needed to get into any legal wrangling about a status of forces agreement. And that continued until the time when the interim government was replaced. The NPFL and others became insistent on a status of forces agreement. But by the time that issue became a hot issue, the interim government had been replaced. So we were not necessarily a significant part of the debate at that time. I was asking for your personal... Oh, um, my personal view? Yeah, not as interim president because I know you were not there. Oh, okay. Well, you know, with hindsight, it seems to me that there was so much fuss about a status of forces agreement, not because of the legal issues involved, but because there was a desire to curtail the operations and to be able to tell ECOMOG to leave. I think, that's my personal viewpoint, that this was a factor driving the insistence. And in fact, uh, if my memory serves me right, there were quite a few um, exchanges between the ECOWAS authority and the ECOMOG High Command on the one hand and uh, Charles Taylor about this, this issue. 
I don't think it was any surprise that we saw more and more the ascendancy of irregular forces to position of security even when ECOMOG was here and a constant uh, bashing of ECOMOG and the expression of the desire to leave. So I think uh, this was all calculated to get ECOMOG out of the way so that irregular forces would become the security forces of our society. Um, a follow-up question to that. Do you think that decision then to have ECOMOG leave under the status of forces agreement without assisting Liberia um, implement the rest of the peace accord like the restructuring of the army and what have you might have served as a catalyst for the April 6, 1996 fighting that took place? Yes. I think uh, the constant bashing of ECOMOG the desire to have ECOMOG retreat to various points and to leave uh, the forces of the irregular armies to do the city level policing and all of that, I think that contributed substantially to the April 6 uh, problem. And I would go further to say that if ECOMOG had been kept a bit longer, and had systematically participated not only in the disarming and the demobilization over a longer period of time, but the raising of a new army, I think we would have been much better off. This was not done to our own regrets. At the time of the 1984 University of Liberia incident where the soldiers invaded the, the campus and it became violent. You were of course in prison. After you came out, did you, were you ever furnished with information on any direct victims of that incident, whether students, uh, faculty members, staff, or even ordinary uh, citizens who were caught up in it? And who were these people? Did you ever meet with some of the families? No. This, for me, Madam, is one of the most painful of experiences in my life. That a raid could have been made on the university campus, orders given to move and remove, if you recall those were the words, to move and remove students and occupants of that campus. And there were people who claimed to have seen others shot. There are people who claimed to have seen bodies taken to the JFK. And yet, there was not a single parent that came forward. I think this tells us much more about the fear and intimidation and the terror of the time than it says about those people who lost their loved ones. Consequently, it was not possible to really even meet with a parent or anybody because nobody came forward. We heard rumors here and there and we checked them out. Some people disappeared. Other relatives never made themselves available. And I believe when I make the recommendation here about investigating through our history during this period, who were the victims? Who were the people who died? Who disappeared? that we can get to the bottom of some of these so that we can in fact restore the identities of these people and indeed the grief that their relatives uh, shared we can now share with them. Okay. A follow-up question to that. 
the University of Liberia being the highest um, institution of learning at the time, and then also hosting professors, well-learned professors and researchers, could the university on its own, at least as part of its uh, fact-finding or um, research, maybe through the um, Department of uh, Sociology or, or, or History or so, could the university have embarked upon maybe a research of that matter to determine what happened? Because it happened on campus, it happened with students, yes. it happened with faculty members. Yes, the university could have. But the university didn't. If you recall, there was a massive dismissal of a lot of people of integrity. Dr. Mary Antoinette Brown Sherman, and may her soul rest in peace, and a number of others were also the victims as far as university leadership goes of this development. And a new um, leadership was brought in and my sense is that in view of the fact that such new leadership may have needed to court the favors of the powers of the day, there may not, it may not have been expedient in their view to raise these issues. Because if you recall at that time, the government was bent on letting the Liberian people and the world know that there were no deaths and hardly any injuries during that time. Okay. Mr. Witness, you became interim president of Liberia, I think inheriting um, the presidency at a time when the country was experiencing its worst in its national history. Um, Liberia was at a time, had just come from a leadership of the legacy of abuse, human rights violations, clamp down on the press. Their opposition was practically driven into oblivion. How would you describe human rights and freedom of the press and all of those tenets of a true democracy under your administration as interim president? Madam, this is one area in which I'm very proud. Um, one of the innovations that we began was the open phone line. We held press conferences or open line. Anybody could call in and could ask any question. And there was a direct conversation going on between me and not just journalists, but me and ordinary people. This was for me a very significant move with respect to the freedom of the press and the opening up of our leaders to the Liberian people. I'm also pleased that even in choosing a Minister of Information, we threw that to the press union. And it was Lamini Wariti, who I think was just the outgoing president of the press union, I'm not quite sure, at that time, that was in fact, uh, that became the Minister of Information. I am very pleased that there was only one occasion I recall when ECOMOG wanted some intervention to close down a newspaper because that newspaper they claim had broken some kind of security uh, uh, regulation. And my intervention at that point prevented the closure of the newspaper. As a matter of fact, we were the ones that suggested to the press union of the day that the decree that muzzled the press 
should be removed and they should take the initiative. And I recall some journalists saying, oh, this government wants to take cheap credit. I said, fine. I'm not quite sure if those regulations or those shackles were ever removed. But I don't think there has been another leader. And I don't say this boastfully. I say this because I've been on both sides of the debate. Who has been willing to take the kinds of criticism and develop the kinds of approach to public scrutiny that I indeed exemplified. I mean, the, uh, um, the leader of the IM, INPFL used to come up to, the, to Salvatore's before the Duca and had terrible things to say about me and above all about my mother, who he never knew. Think about abuses to a mother. Nothing ever happened. Occasion after occasion, the Ecomog command would say to me, do you want us to have this man arrested? I said, no. I feel that when you are in public service, you have a choice. If you desire excessive privacy, then get out of the kitchen. But if you're going to stay in public service, your life should be open to scrutiny. And so I'm pleased that I had an opportunity to in fact help to advance the freedom of the press and freedom of speech in a way that we can enjoy it today. Mr. Witness, um, what do you really know about what happened to the Liberian journalist, Mr. John Vambo, who was allegedly beaten by Ecomog soldiers and never recovered? He died allegedly from the beating. I think he sought treatment abroad. You assisted him with money to go abroad for treatment. Can you clarify some of these uh, issues? What we did here was that John Vambo had had some altercation with the Ecomog people and had gotten injured. Our concern were, were largely at that point with his health to see if he could get some treatment. And John Vambo never recovered. I think to the extent that there was a incident with ECOMOG that affected a journalist, that affected the life of that journalist, the Vambo story is still to be fully explained and I think it is one that should be part of an investigation of what happened with press freedom in this country. I wish that I had paid a little bit more attention to that uh, incident to the extent that we would have had for you, even before now, a full story of what happened with John Vambo. And I should tell you that John Vambo was a courageous journalist and a good friend of mine. Long before the Ecomog incident in the 70s, he was a reporter who was fearless and a reporter who was courageous. I rate him as among the really good ones of our country and I think his death is regrettable and is a tragedy for us. I am hoping that in an investigation of those who died and how they died, John Vambo's story will be fully told. My last question, I hope. You, um, you sort of preempted my last question when you mentioned um, the kind of freedom of speech that existed during your administration as interim president. 
And I remember clearly, um, as a journalist and myself at that time, the speaker, um, Senator Johnson, who was then the head of the INPFL, was fond of riding around sometimes when he was not happy with you with his loudspeaker and raining insults, including on your mother, like you said. Even at that time, there was no love lost between you and him. But that was 15 years ago, I think, 14, 15 years ago. Today is today, and we are discussing peace and then reconciliation. Mr. Johnson was here, or Senator Johnson was here a few days ago, and again, from um, his testimony, he mentioned you a lot, and it, didn't, it wasn't a friendly, honorable mention of you each time, and uh, you also here didn't seem to really want to mention him, not in a way. I'm just thinking, since we're discussing reconciliation as a people, do you think there's any hope that perhaps you and Senator Johnson might want to maybe um, find time to bury the hatchet, maybe um, try to reach out to each other for the sake of, rec of reconciliation and working together as one people? Is it possible? How do you think that can be done? Commissioner, I have no hatchet to, I don't have a hatchet, let alone one to be buried with, uh, with Senator uh, Johnson. If you, and I didn't follow his, his uh, tirade uh, completely, but the relationship with him and the interim government became sour after we changed the banknote. And that tells you a whole lot. So, I have interacted with the Senator several times, more recently. He is on, I think, the Security or Defense Committee of, uh, of the Senate. And we have been doing security sector reform. And so we've had to interact with that uh, committee. I go constantly to the Liberian uh, Senate, to the legislature, to transact governance uh, reform business. And I am on good terms and have a good professional working relationship with everybody there. And to my knowledge, that includes Senator Johnson. So to the extent that the changing of the bank note or whatever it is remains a source of grievances, of outbursts, I think it is for the senator to uh, perhaps outgrow that. But surely, I can say to you honestly, there is absolutely no one in this country to whom I'm not prepared to extend a hand. I believe that this country has to find a way to understand the past, to have a deep appreciation for its meaning to us today, and we should be prepared to move forward. Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Witness, or Dr. Sawyer, as whatever, or Mr. Chairman of the Reform Commission. And let me say thanks for your presentation that in a way tried to put into perspective the problems as well as the origin of those problems that continue to haunt us as a nation. So although uh, you have spoken on that, and there have been other speakers who have in the past also spoken to the same issues, 
I hope uh, you will not mind that I hope you will not mind that uh, I will raise again some of these uh, questions mm -hmm. and perhaps too for the benefit of the public. But as a way of uh, beginning, uh, can you tell us your entry into public life? What were your motivations, your perspectives that culminated finally into or that led you and others into the formation of the movement for justice in Africa as well as uh, Susuku. I I've been active in organizations for most of my life. As a, uh, a high school student, I was active in a high Y and came to the university and was active in the Y phalanx. I went to graduate school at a time when there was great fermentation about the Vietnam War in the United States and about the civil rights issues. I went to a school outside Chicago, a university outside Chicago, Northwestern University. It was a university that in a way had been associated with African liberation struggles. Eduardo Monlani had been to that university and there was a strong support organization there and in the Chicago area for the liberation movement in Mozambique. That impacted me, the fact that there could be liberation support organizations of Americans. And here in Africa, we hardly heard of them in countries that were not in the vicinity of the conflicts. Also in Chicago, there was a strong <coughs> movement of the Gaviites, the Marcus Gavi organization. And a friend of mine invited me one day to attend one of their meetings. And that also had a tremendous impact on me, the sort of pride and self-help and black entrepreneurship that the Gavi movement promoted. This too was an era where black students were trying to establish a sense of identity and call attention to the need for the university to be sensitive to their needs. This was the time of Robert Kennedy and there was the time of the killing, the assassination of Martin Luther King and of Robert Kennedy. So where I went to university, there was quite a bit of fermentation about change. At the same time here in Liberia, you will recall in the late 60s, there were fermentations too of a slightly different nature, but all bearing on the need for democratization and deepening the involvement of people in their governance processes. The Fambulet trial. There was a time when security agents had gone to the university and unhooked the door on the men's toilet and took it to the mansion so President Tubman could read the gra graffiti on the door that was critical of him and to deal with the situation. University students were put on the line to parade. We love Tubman. And they didn't really mean it, but there were such command performances. I can talk about these as influences in my own circumstance. 
but others had similar experiences. At this time, there were many other Liberians in various parts of the world and in the United States who were following closely and becoming associated with the efforts of the last stages to remove the last stages of colonialism of our continent. The struggle in Mozambique, in Angola, in Cape Verde were very high on the agenda. So by the time I came home to the university, I became involved in efforts along with others, including Dr. Tipote here, to organize a support group for the liberation struggle. That was the original objective of Moja. There was none around here. And so if you recall, in the first meetings, we were talking about bringing in someone who could deal with the struggles in uh, Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. In fact, one of the leading lawyers, the Minister of Justice, who later I'm told became the Chief Justice, Fidelis Armada, was invited here to brief us on the struggle in Guinea-Bissau and what we could do to help. Mind you, Liberia has a tradition of support for liberation struggles. Nelson Mandela mentions this in his book, Long Road to Freedom, I think it's called, that the first $10,000 he ever handled in his life was given to him by President Tubman, five for himself and five for the movement. He had never had this kind of money before. Many people in the liberation movements carried Liberian passports. So this was a Liberian tradition of support for liberation struggles, but it had always been government support. The Liberian people now had not been very much involved. And so this was our effort. Also on the ground during that time was Professor Vusumsi Make, who was a professor at the University of Liberia and, and my colleague in the Department of Political Science when I returned. I met him in the department. But Vusmake was also the West African representative of the Pan-Africanist Congress of South Africa. And so all these forces, so Dr. Tipote's presence, my presence, students who were really excited about doing something beyond what was happening to them in their local communities, all converged, and this is how Moja started, the movement for justice in Africa. Its first thrust was about the liberation, support for the liberation movements in Africa. I recall very well at the Monrovia City Hall on one of the anniversaries, and we used March 21st as the anniversary. Because March 21st, if you remember, 1960 was the Sharpeville Massacre. It was the time when the South African police killed more than, I think, 40 Africans, largely children. And so that was Moja's anniversary. We showed a film called End of a Dialogue about the Sharpeville Massacre in the Monrovia City Hall, and after which a discussion ensued. And I will not forget that during that discussion, as the movie had shown the shanty towns, the townships of South Africa, there were people in the audience who said, but this place looked like West Point. The thing that's happening in that place, the same level of poverty exists here in our country. How can we just talk about South Africa and we can't talk about here? That is how the dual agenda came up to deal with questions of poverty here and change here and at the same time 
to focus on liberation support activities. And so that's the beginning. As we began to deal more and more with the Liberian case, that's when the hitches developed. Because the issues of, that I mentioned this morning were all emerging issues on the agenda of Liberians. Even before Moja began to address them, the revelation was addressing them. Albert Port was addressing them. There was another uh, uh, magazine called The Voice. There was Afa Fanga, a range of magazines and fora existed for the debate of those issues. And so this is, to make a long story short, this is, these were the factors that really uh, drove my own involvement. And I'm sure every one of the leaders would tell his own story about the simplicity of lifestyle. Let me, let me say something about this. When I joined the university, I had a paycheck of about 400, well, a, 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 a gross pay of about $400, a net uh, of something like 300, early $300. That was my paycheck. I came back from school with very little. Whatever little monies I earned through part-time jobs, my parents had been trying to build a house on Cadwell Road for 10 years. I gave it to them to complete the house. And at the university, with my salary, I was hardly unable to do very much. So what I did, a cousin of mine introduced me to a Lebanese man on Camp Johnson Road. That man gave me what we called an LPA. For 50% of my check for a given period, I was able to get a hot plate stove, two burners. I was able to get a radio, one of those transistor radios, a fan, and a small refrigerator, those, those small things. And I was paying 100 and I think $61 or something like that of my paycheck for that. With very little money, what was I supposed to do about transportation going back and forth to the university? I used to ride the bus. Not because I thought to make a political statement, but because I had an economic need. I lived at the Joe Bar Junction. I would hop on that bus every morning, wearing blue jeans that I brought, and some tie-dye t-shirts, and this became a sensation. Why? Because here was a PhD, but no money, taking a bus. And I was not ashamed of this, but I think just as today, I am happy that I'm able, that I can walk down the street, go to a local bar, and drink some beer with some people there. I am in, indeed delighted that I have this predisposition and this flexibility. So, I think here we need deeper understandings of people's motivations, of people's own character, their predisposition. And if we were to build bridges and talk more across the assumptions that we make, we really would build better interpersonal relationships and move the images that we have of people who we don't know well. Sorry to be so long-winded, but I, I, I thought to say a little bit more than you asked. Now I'm talking about images, especially uh, stereotyped images. There's a story that, uh, as you mentioned Garve, that uh, there was a school, the Marcus Garve School, that according to uh, what has been said, and even by some uh, who appeared before this commission, that you organized uh, a school called the Marcus Garvey School, and was there propagating a socialist ideology <laughs> to your students, one of whom was 
the late President Samuel Doe. When I was leaving my studies in uh, Chicago, as I told you, a friend had taken me into the Marcus Garvey uh, to one of their meetings. At that meeting, or at one of those meetings, when I was introduced as a Liberian, in fact, after the meeting, one of the members called me aside and asked me if I knew what was happening about the Marcus Garvey uh, branch here in Liberia. I had never heard of a Marcus Garvey organization here. That person gave me the name of the Reverend Clarence Harding, who was, uh, they have a title for, but, but, but the person on the ground who was in charge of the Marcus Garvey organization. I came home and put that piece of paper aside and didn't really get to it until one day while I was clearing out some, some things. I found, I found that piece of paper with the name Clarence Hardin and that they had a school on Clay Street opposite demonstration school. So one evening I went to look for Reverend Harding and I was fascinated by what he was doing there. That little building was jam-packed with people who were going to school, sitting almost like sardines in a tin, one close to another, hot. But this man had a program of education for people who worked in the day, including soldiers who left BTC in the evening and went there to school. It's not far from BTC, as you know. I was so impressed by what he was trying to do, I volunteered to help. Not only to help myself, but to recruit some of my socially conscious students who would spare the time to go there and teach free of charge. There are many, some of whom you know, who spend their evenings at Marcus Garvey free of charge. There was a time when the Ministry of Education was trying to close down this school, as they were trying to close down many schools, and many of us decided to put much more time free of charge there as if we were members of the regular staff. I taught social studies there, and so did many of my students. Some taught mathematics. And of course, when they saw the roster, the Ministry of Education saw the roster of this school, they got interested in going there to see if these people were really there, and they were there. So this was a regular high school, not organized by me, but organized by someone who had an interest in the education of Liberian youth and was indeed supported by people like myself. About Samuel Doe, I must tell you this much. In the 10th grade class, I remember going in one evening and there was the 10th grade social studies teacher was absent. And so I went in to take the, the, the class for the evening. I put up a map just to talk about identify Af map of Africa, countries, capitals, uh, major cities, the kinds of things, a bit of African history, independence struggles and all that. And we had a very engaging discussion. Not a single word about Liberia. And I recall vividly during the meeting, during that, that presentation, that class session, there was a student who asked me, so why when you people learn your book, you don't like to join the army? My response to that student was, you know, well, some people like military, others don't like military. And so I don't, I never thought about being a military person and so I'm not one and so that's it. The student didn't respond again. This was about 1976, about that period, I'm not quite sure. Years later, 
In fact, in 1980, after the coup, in one of my meetings with head of state Doe, he said to me, do you remember in Marcus Garvey's school, somebody asked you why you don't like to be, to join the army? And of course I remember that question. I said, yes, I remember that question. He said, I was the one who asked you that question. That was indeed the extent of my relationship prior to the coup with Master Sergeant Doe. He also told me, and so did many members of the PRC at the time, because remember the coup took place within months after, or I should say, just say a little bit over a year, after the postponement of the mayoral elections. He and many others had from time to time said, but you know, Prof. Doc, Y'all can take chances, or your people, y'all don't like security business. So when you were at the university that day speaking about the mayor campaign, when you and Chuchu Houghton were running for that job, I was in the crowd outside. And from where I was standing, I had a clear view of your head. Why y'all don't like to take security precautions? The political activities of the day were followed very closely by a lot of people, including the junior men in uniform. So this thing about people having to spoon feed these fellas is really wrong. The level of discourse in this society was being followed very closely by some people we didn't even know. Mass rallies involve a whole lot of people, not just students, market women. That mayor campaign was supported by a range of people, including government people who used to come in the night and bring money to support it. This was a period where the signals for change was all over the place. There was an epoch that was about to birth, and we didn't know it. Now, uh, talking about that, coming as a young PhD at a university in a situation where students are attracted to your lectures and yourself projecting an influence beyond the scope of the university, I mean, uh, clearly, uh, within the ruling circles, uh, there must have been some apprehension about your activities since, in a way, they constitute a threat to the established order. How did, from your perspective, looking back, how did the establishment perceive your activities as a threat? And if they did perceive your activities as a threat, how did their responses manifest in their day-to-day -day relations, in their operations, and what, and what have you? I don't think they saw me as much as a threat as indeed they saw Dr. Tipote as a threat. Dr. Tipote, if you remember, was the man who had come in the society, who took a step of changing his name, and who decided that he would relate to the masses of Liberian people. I think that name change has bothered a whole lot of people for a long time. Now, if you think about it, when somebody decides that he wants to be called by a certain name, how offensive is that to anybody? Every individual has a right of self-identity. Now, what they really saw of me, the establishment, was perhaps someone who, as part of this group, had the potential of becoming dangerous to whatever the establishment was. And also, I should say that in the way in which we operated, in Moja, 
I was always the one and it was deliberate because I was considered less threatening I was always the one to sign the letters to go up front to the meetings since there was not as much venom if you will towards me as it was to Dr. Tipote and until now I fully cannot understand why there was so much uh, bitterness largely because a man decided to change his name with respect to my teaching when I got in the university this was a time when two years after I got in there was an effort to improve the curriculum there was not a single course introductory course that brought together all of the various elements of Liberian society to teach our students our culture our history and all of this yeah there was a course in Liberian government and that sort of thing but we decided to create a course introduction to Liberian society it was my task to design that course and it was made a compulsory course by the university authorities there was no book so we had to compile notes from various articles out of that exercise over some five years of work I compiled enough notes and did sufficient research that I could later publish a book on the Liberian society now my students were very diligent they enjoyed the introduction to various aspects in fact at one point I remember a, a, a time when we were talking about the Pora I'm not a member of the Pora Society but it is important that Liberians in their own discourse intellectual discourse about their society know what the Pora is about as a socializing mechanism they don't have to know all the internal secrets and all that and so we were talking about the Pora as a socializing agent and this student who was a Pora member jumped up and said we're not going to have that here I calmly backed off he said his piece and we had a good discussion as to what was fit for discussion in the course that's the kind of course I ran it was open people came from other courses if you will it was put at six o'clock in the evening and so students came there to take it or to hear what we had to say nothing magical but just an attempt to deepen our understandings of the Liberian reality some of the things we talked about this morning about policies of assimilation about settlements policy were all among the issues that we tried to discuss during that time and for me those were really productive years of work and of nurturing even for myself and I hope also for my students now if we should move uh, fast forward to the 70s especially to what one may consider the most climatic uh, event and that is uh, the rest riots quote-unquote from your perspectives uh, looking back what can you say about that particular event as some call it a watershed event but what from your reflections what was the situation like in the build-up and in the immediate aftermath you know when I reflect on that development the one thing that comes to my mind is what a failure of communication can do because I had an opportunity to work on both sides of that uh, of that crisis on the one hand I remember well that members of the PAL in one of the meetings that took place on the eve 
of that uh, event had decided that they would call it off. That they were going to let the crowds gather as if in a rally. There would be some speech making and they would disperse. This was the planned response as, be as best as I know at that time to the government's position that this rally must not take place. On the other hand, I also know of the efforts of the religious leaders, particularly Bishop Brown, the Reverend Ituomo Reeves, and uh, Mr. Albert Port, who were working the circuit, going back and forth. I remember they had gotten a commitment from the PAL people not to proceed. And they were trying to get the president to commit not to sending out the troops. Now, in all of this, there were lots of functionaries. What kind of information the president was getting, I don't know. But I recall that by the time that morning, the team of Albert Port, Tomo Reeves, and Bishop Brown could eventually get to the mansion and to talk with the president. Instructions had apparently been given to disperse the crowds. And the use of live ammunition had taken place. So, maybe in this day of improved communication with the cell phone and all kinds of other gadgets, we stand a better chance of avoiding such a development, if at all there was a genuine misunderstanding as a result of this uh, communication problem. So that's one of the things that I recall, how we could have averted if that last meeting with the president had taken place before the first round of ammunition was, was fired. I also wonder sometimes what would have happened if the strategy of the PAL was not to wait until, I think they were waiting until noon, but to begin early in the morning to hold whatever assemblage of people, since people start gathering very early, so that there could have been some kind of a word out that in fact the demonstration had been postponed or canceled. So as far as the immediate situation at that time, I also have some observations about the role of security agents and our security agencies. I wonder sometimes whether their zealousness as they demonstrated during that time was a re as a result of instructions that they received or as a result of their own desire to please the bosses. Because some of the things that happened with respect to the seeming initiatives of some security agents, I think went beyond what was necessary. It would be interesting to take a look at the records of the security agency during this period. What were they reporting to the boss? What kinds of information they were feeding to the decision makers. OK, 
Okay, um, if we shoot Ted, let me be uh, fast forward. You already uh, spoken about the coup and uh, what you know of how those uh, executions went. But we should go a little further ahead. When the time, at the time when, uh, because you, you can recall that prior to the setting up of the Constitution Commission, mm -hmm. there had been quite some rumblings. Students had uh, expressed uh, displeasure over the manner in which government was being run. And one of the students was, uh, one of the student leaders was banned and proscribed from interacting with uh, society and eventually was forced to leave the country. And then we saw the detention of uh, other student leaders with the threat of execution, which was, uh, and the leader got a reprieve. But by the time of the setting up of the Constitution Commission, would you say that the setting up of that commission was a response to these varying pressures that was mounting on uh, the government or it was out of uh, a genuine desire to actually return to the barracks, so to speak? I think it, it was... It was a result of some pressure. I, and, and let me say that I don't think at that early stage there was a clear-cut you know, uh, decision in the minds of the military people as to what they wanted to do. If you recall, these, these fellows were so busy going around town, taking cars from people. Uh, I mean, within a six-month period, I think they bust up two sets of cars or something. They were going around investigating this and investigating that and all that. And there was so much chaos that when the students made the, the, I think it was in May, the students were the first to call for a return to the barracks in a demonstration in May, a month after. This was the beginning of the falling out. And it was at this point and subsequent points that more and more people began to talk about, well, look, this thing, we better start finding a way to end it. So the pressure indeed was mounting. I don't think they had a deep appreciation of what to do because my impression is that they were just at that point so busy in, you know, driving fast cars and as they used to say, going away to explain the, uh, the purposes and objectives, the aims and objectives of the revolution and all that. But there was indeed quite a bit of uh, convergence of a lot of people's views that the way forward here was to put in place a constitution process, as I explained this morning. And they didn't feel immediately threatened by it. Some of them embraced it. But some of them felt that it was so far down the road that, well, you know, let's let it work. By and large, I think, as indeed the work of the Constitution Commission went on, and it dawned on more and more of them, especially head of state Dole, that at the end of this process, he would need to retire. I think that's when he started putting roadblocks in the way of, uh, of the work. The other part of your question basically about students and about those who were putting pressure on the government, I think we often forget that those people who in fact had been blamed for the excesses of that period, largely the so-called progressives, were the first to be harassed and pursued by that government. So by the end of the first year, hardly any of these people carried any significant sway in that government. Students were on the run. Dr. Tipote had to go in exile. 
and a lot of others had to in fact become low key in an attempt to survive here. My work with the Constitution Commission, commission, uh, com commission virtually protected me and I stayed with that activity. And so the, 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 the arrest of students, Ezekiel Pajabo, James Fromoya, uh, Lucia Masili, the detention in Belayala, the banning of Khomeini, we said this is the first time ever in, in my own experience I heard of an individual being banned in his own country. A release was issued by the, uh, the head of state that nobody should talk to this man. He was a vulnerable man. In other words, anybody who wanted to do anything, there was a field day on him. I remember in the middle of the night taking Khomeini to go and see some of the more sympathetic members of the PRC to see if we could indeed arrange some way that he could get some safe passage out of this country or that is if they would not let uh, leave him alone. So. If we were talking about those who were the, who bore the brunt of the repression of that period, we have to put the student leaders and people who indeed were visible activists in Moja in that category of people. Okay. Um you already uh, talked about uh, the draft constitution and how there were portions of that draft that were not included in the approved uh, draft that went to referendum. However, the question is, how has the lack of inclusion of those provisions in a way impacted our political uh, development to the point where in the final analysis we find ourselves engulfed in a protracted uh, civil war? I think a number of things. One, the referendum on the Constitution would have been different had there not been an environment of brutal repression. People would have studied that constitution a bit more and may have even insisted on its revision. But the adoption of the constitution was seen as a way of getting rid of the military and having the elections. So the whole electoral system actually was not fully examined and the document itself was not fully examined because people wanted a change and so we found ourselves stuck with the provisions in that document largely because people saw those provisions as less of an evil than having them rejected and prolonging the stay of the military that's one thing. But if you look at the provisions themselves, they have some really dangerous consequences or implications, I should say better still, for democratic governance here. And we must change them. The tenure of office of a senator for nine years is wholly too long. Much too long. The interference of the president in the professional recruitment of officers of our military down to the rank of lieutenant is much too intrusive. It prohibits the growth of professionalism. And this means that no matter all the restructuring you can do, if the president decides that, that the president will appoint a new corps of junior officers at the rank of lieutenants, the president can do that and replace all those officers that you have. That is what our constitution says and that's how it that is the powers 
they bestow on on the president on the president the president is still free to appoint just about anybody any lawyer to the position of a judge there's too much leeway here given to the president and these were in fact in my view tailor-made so that President Doe could exercise these powers. So I believe we have here an opportunity that we can in a way make some changes that can mitigate the impact actually to remove the, 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 the potential impact of these provisions on our constitutional life. But by then you say that uh, what you referred what you referred to earlier as uh, over centralization and patrimonial control, would you say by then uh, such over centralization and patrimonial control, as well as those measures that were proposed in the change, in a way accentuated this very situation that uh, has been our nemesis? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think I think so. I think when we had an already highly centralized government and by culture we like this chief the big chief the president as a chief and you have this thing about you know let go see what a big man say you know and when you add legal authority onto this cultural practice by stockpiling that position with all of these legal tools, these constitutional tools, it becomes much too powerful. We have to do something about that. Okay, if we should just move uh, on a little bit. Um, come the 1989 and we hear about the launching of a revolution to unseat though. But prior to that time, Liberians in exile had begun to discuss the future of the country. And they did so in a number of associations and uh, groups. And one of such groups was the Association for Constitutional Democracy of Liberia, ACDL. Yeah. Now, there have been claims and uh, charges that the ACDL was formed as a direct support group for Charles Taylor's, uh, what he called uh, the, his uh, revolution in 1989. Can you speak to that? What was the ACDL, why was it formed, and who was its founders, and whether there was any link of support to Mr. Taylor? ACDL stands for the Association for Constitutional Democracy in Liberia. I was among the founding members there were lots of Liberians in the United States who joined on. ACDL operated independently of EULA, the Union of Liberian Associations in the Americas. And its own activity were largely about lobbying, if you will, the American government and other international agencies to support a process of change in Liberia, a process, as the name says, constitutional change. We wanted free and fair elections under conditions where there would be a level playing field. I can tell you this, and I can tell you this without fear of any uh, contradiction by anybody. One, that ACDL as an organization never supported Charles Taylor. Some members of ACDL supported Charles Taylor as individuals, perhaps even using the name of the organization. But that organization in its mean body, never supported Charles Taylor. And let me say here personally, I never supported Charles Taylor. 
Not a dime did I contribute at any time to the support of Charles Taylor. What was I don't hold it against anybody who did, because at that time, let's, re let's remember, the Taylor uprising here was popular. Large numbers of people. Remember the time they were saying, we want Chucky? Let Chucky come? There were lots of people who supported Charles Taylor. Tom Wuyu has said repeatedly that in the meetings in which the question of support for Charles Taylor came about, I staunchly opposed it. Did the, AC, did the ACDL as an organization adopt any posture on the conflict as, and did it advance any proposals as to how it saw the conflict being brought to an end? I think we, we supported the proposal for an interim government. Do you not remember this time there were, there were several proposals floating around? And let me say, everybody, every Liberian wanted some kind of a solution. The Interfed Mediation Committee was making some proposals. Everybody was trying to tweak at those proposals to find a way forward. Some Liberians here signed a document and say, well, let's have a, a uh, what do you call it, a transitional government for six months with Mr. Taylor and let him thereafter turn over to somebody. He must be a, a, a transitional leader. There were others who came up with proposals say, no, let us put in a transitional government and in six months, let's hold elections. I will not hold it against anybody who came up with a, an idea. The key here is that all of these ideas were rejected by Mr. Taylor. That is the important issue. There are those not that people were not trying. They were trying because they wanted a way forward. Even the Interfed Mediation Committee's proposal that became the ECOWAS Peace Plan, he adopted and then rejected. We went to Yamasokro several times. He put proposals on the table. Everybody agreed to them, and then he rejected them. He went to Geneva. We signed an agreement there. He signed himself in Hufwe Buenis residence. By the time he got back into, into Ivory Coast, he said that signature was not his genuine signature. So I think these are the issues that are significant here, and not the efforts of a lot of individuals who, in good faith, we're looking for one way or another to move this process forward. So would you say then that your argument that you just presented, mm -hmm. does it put to rest claims that uh, 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 Mr. Taylor would have entered into negotiations, but owing to the declaration by some politicians in Freetown at a meeting, signing a statement, saying that they recognized Mr. Taylor should head the government and that led to, or that sent to his grave the proposals to uh, have an arrangement where uh, there will be, all sides will be accommodated in which Mr. Taylor will not be president but would be free to contest elections. That's utter nonsense. People who say that did not follow the proceedings very closely. Let me tell you what was even a better deal Mr. Taylor and I met in uh, the offices of President Iadima in Togo. President Iadima set it up that we would have one-on-one. -on -one. We went in a room and I said to him, Charlie, we need to find a way to bring peace in Liberia. I am ready to step aside any time. If there are ways in which we can help you, because we know you have incurred expenses in all of this fighting, if there is any way we can make your expense part of a national debt so that we can then go to elections, we'll be ready to do so. You know what he said to me? He said, Baba, I got expenses you can't understand. That was Charles Taylor's response. All right? We met several times in Hufwe Buane's house. In Yamasukro, we had a meeting at which, as I said this morning, Mr. Taylor complained that he didn't trust Ekumor, but he had all of this territory under his control and he wanted to go to elections as quickly as possible. This was how the Senegalese came here. Remember the Senegalese de were deployed in, I think in Lofa or someplace in a number wow. of other places, in Vahom. All right. 
And there were lots of people who were deployed, lots of forces deployed around this country. We were all set poised to go to elections once those forces were, in fact, deployed. As soon as those forces began the deployment, people around the country began to gain confidence. Many of them surged to Monrovia. Mr. Taylor saw this. And by that time, suspected that he would have a difficulty winning elections. And put every obstacle in the way of going to the ballot box as a result of the Yamasukra meetings. So there was ample time, ample time, ample opportunities. The two things were being at stake at that time, were at stake at the time. One, that there should be disarmament. People must not vote with a gun to their heads. Two, there must be an electoral process. We must not just, you know, anoint somebody who had shot his way into power. What change would it have been? So the holding of free and fair elections, especially at a time when everybody knew that Charles Taylor was very popular. And the longer he talked, and the longer he talked, there brought doubts, his own confidence perhaps in his ability to win, to win elections, diminished, until a brand new situation presented itself years later. So I think it is a misperception to think that one proposal among scores of proposal coming from various Liberian quarters, including from the Interfaith Mediation Committee, that any of those at any moment in those early stages would have made a difference. That is a stretch that is much too far, given the circumstances we know, much too far to accept. So would you say that the apparent intractability that resulted as well as the intransigence of uh, Mr. Taylor, were, were, were they influenced in any way by extraneous factors such as uh, regional or sub-regional interests or, uh, or economic interests by uh, external powers or so? Well, I don't know. I, I, like I say, when, when I had a one-on-one -on -one with Mr. Taylor, this is what he told me, that he had obligations. He never, you know, spoke further on the obligations, what they were uh, and, and how he intended to, to meet them. He talked about uh, ob obligations. I do know that President Hufri Buani seemed to have been convinced during the Yamasokra series from what he had heard Mr. Taylor say that he could win elections and that the old man wanted to get those forces that Taylor wanted deployed so that we could move on. And by 1992, he was at a total loss that even with the deployment of those forces, nothing was happening. He called me and I had a meeting with him and he said, I don't know what is happening to your brother, Mr. Taylor. Your compatriot has let me down because I was hoping that by now I would have been able to solve this problem. This was Hufwe Bwani one year before he died. All of those who had thought that a Yamasukra series of talks would have borne some fruit were disappointed because at the end of the day, all of the demands that were made by Taylor, he reneged on all of them. During this period, were there any engagement or any attempts to reach out to the Americans? Or were they in any way involved in such discussions? Did they have any inf uh, inf uh, influencing uh, capacity on the outcome of all these discussions that went on? The Americans were the ones who were very keen on having us go to Yamasukra. Somehow they were convinced that because the Nigerians 
And you remember at this time, the Americans did not have a good relationship with Nigeria. They didn't like the military regime there. They were pressing President Hufu Bwani to take the leadership in the hope that he could solve this problem. They too were at loss when this did not, did not work. And so you had a situation where they were always in the background, but never taking responsibility to step up to the plate and do something about this situation. Now, at the time you were meeting in Banjul, uh, there were some attempts by the Americans to intervene, as was revealed by uh, a former secretary, uh, assistant secretary of state, uh, uh, Cohen. Uh, at the time of the Banjul meeting, were you aware that the Americans had tried to reach an arrangement with Mr. Taylor and that would have seen President Doe leave Liberia through a corridor to Sierra Leone? Were no, I was not aware of this. As a matter of fact, for a while, we were using the Americans to transmit our messages to people on the ground here. They then told us that they would have to stop this because they did not want to get involved in the Liberian struggle. That is why we began to send people here on helicopters and by boat to bring messages here and to have some contact with uh, what was going on here. We want to thank you very much, sir, for being with us today. And with your indulgence, we want to adjourn to this session at this time to resume edit tomorrow morning with the remainder of the questioning, which will be Steve will continue, and then Commissioner Coleman, and then myself. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hearing Officer, we will adjourn for tomorrow morning at 10.